Welcome everybody to another episode of the Key to Games podcast. Here on Game Wisdom, we're examining the art and science of games. It is a very busy and a weather-related night here. We had some thunderstorms here in New Jersey earlier, and now we're just getting set up for our chat. But join me, my co-host from a Casual Game Studio, Joshua Reyes. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Just made it back in time from the mountains in Ohio. Uh, so I got here in time, so I'm ready to get rocking. Mm-hmm. We shall see if people show up, because we are starting a little bit late. But only for the people watching this recorded, they are going to get to enjoy our discussion on difficulty design. Or talking about difficulty when it comes to games. Yeah. So, uh, as we talked about last time, we have kind of the next big game from, from Software, Armored Core 6. And it is certainly not a Souls-like, as people keep trying to throw it in there. But have you had a chance to play through it all yet? I've just played a little bit. I didn't have too much time. I had a busy dev week, so I really only got maybe to, I don't even think, the first tutorial boss. I know you put some time into it, Josh. I was interested in your opinion on it and how you felt of it was a Souls-like. I don't think it would have classified as a Souls like as we talked about on our uh, last week's episode as we were uh, with Mir and I discussing a Souls like design. As it's definitely more about kind of, I guess, like the customization aspect of building your AC more than anything else. And it is a game where you really need, I need to do my review of it once I'm finished with all the image sourcing for the Souls like book. But it is a game where the difficulty is either in player skill or what your AC can do. If you're really good at the game, you don't really need to rely too much on building your AC. If you need to build your AC, then you can kind of use that to get around when you're having trouble with, you know, not dodging, taking too many hits. Like, for me, once I sell on the AC I wanted, that was it. Like, I think I've swapped out maybe, like, three parts like the entire game once I just found your optimal build Mm -hmm. and what worked for you right and and I think that's basically what the game like that's the game's difficulty slider and it's a way right as we get into it it's like okay either you have mastered the rule set of your mech and what you can do or if not maybe you need a little more advantage of Mm -hmm. building it out but as you said it seems to be based around building it out though Mm -hmm. and it is a game where They really, again, like this is kind of like From Solver's MO, it's kind of the school of hard knocks. As anyone who got stuck at the helicopter or Baltaeus and so on. I think the longest I spent fighting a boss in that game was 20 minutes. I think that was the longest it took me to be one boss in it. And that was the uh, Ibis Ibis fight. Basically a two who a laser bullet hell. (laughs) That was the toughest fight. Yeah, I watched I watched your fights, and I was like, I definitely don't have his build. <laughs> mm-hmm. But again, all I needed was a shotgun in one hand, a short-range weapon, and my chainsaw sword, and, you know, that's it. That's all I needed in order to win the game. That sounds like, yeah, that sounds like a perfect combo, actually, mm-hmm. yeah. And there's a lot to discuss about difficulty, and I posted a, a design article on Game Wisdom a few days ago about kind Excellent of like... Read how people have trouble, I think, processing difficulty. As a point, the thumbnail that I chose, or some of the characters in it, is from Labyrinth from Project Moon. And the the kind of saying everyone who plays a Project Moon game says is that their difficulty wall is a cliff. like Or no, their difficulty spike is a wall, basically. Or it's a vertical... Uh, <laughs> it's just a vertical. That's what their difficulty curve is. It's just a vertical it's line. A in, impassable line, right. Yeah. Yeah, and anyone who's played Labami Corporation, like we all know, the struggles of Day Forty Nine in that game. And I think when you have a new edict that you're not allowed to talk about difficulty in a game until you beat Labami Corporation, because <laughs> it is painful. And part of the uh, the other part was from Lobby Aruna, which was slightly less play- painful, but still very high up there. And difficulty when we discuss this, when it comes from game design. It's very easy, and I want to get your thoughts on this since you've played quite a bit of action games as much as I have. It's very easy to get into this mindset that there is the true way to play a game. We see this in any skill-intensive reflex-driven game. How many people have said 
get good at Dark Souls. Or, uh, if you remember that uh, meme that someone said about, you know, you have not only cheated your, you have not only cheated the game, but, your, but yourself if cheat you self, use a, a cheat mod yourself. for Sekiro. Right. And I just want to get your thoughts on, like, that kind of, like, there's one way to play the game mindset. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that's, like, real. I mean, like, when we think about Elden Ring, right, that kind of came up. Like, if, mm-hmm. uh, if you wanted to play Elden Ring as, like, our only original Dark Souls, like, just hardcore with the club, you'd probably have a harder time, right? And it's, like, if the game gives you those tools, right, and that's kind of where the aspect comes in, it gives you those tools, then you can use them. If it is available to you, there's a way to play that. Like, I don't think there's a reason to, like, uh, artificially, like, create barriers that may be your skill levels or, like, ways that you don't enjoy the game, right? And to be forced upon that because that's the correct way to play the game, right? Um, because I have suffered so you much suffer the same way, right? I don't, I don't, that's not the way of difficulty, right? Like, the, the way, the tool set that the game gives you is what you can exploit, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. I, that's how I see it. I mean, if, if you if, if like I think my first dark DS one playthrough, I literally used a mage and I shot spells from 20 feet away the whole time. The next playthrough I got, I did it with the club. Right. But it was like my how I wanted to advance in the game. You know, like I mean, I had to play it on easy mode first. I was busy. I was devying. So, you know, giving you those tool sets. Right. Uh, help alleviate also like artificial difficulty. Right. So. Mm-hmm. I don't know. How do you feel? Do you feel the same way, Josh? Like, if there is a certain way yeah. you have to play the game? Yeah, I'm not a fan of that right. kind of mindset. The, and again, like, people who follow me know that I've never been a huge, like, min-max lover when it comes to a lot of the games. Because I feel it it robs the game of, you know, Indeed. that enjoyment of, like, getting into it. Like, if I know that, okay, I need... Six sword mastery, three agility, four stealth, and that is the easiest way to play it. People are going to play it that way. Um, right. I forget, and the, and the, that saps so much from like. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine like the pain game developers feel when they see min max builds and like, oh my gosh, like I wanted, mm-hmm. I had lore laid out. It was all mm-hmm. under level design, and then like you just like you know exactly what to do, and it again, like you said, it just totally like it breaks the game in a way, and it takes away like. Mm-hmm. The whole difficulty design of it. So sorry to cut you off there, but yeah. um, I forget who said. I think this was probably when we were talking with Seth that gamers will do everything they can to optimize the fun out mm-hmm. of the game. And again, there is fun in optimization as someone who has played many an idle game, an automation game, that kind of thing. But that's yeah. a different kind of optimization. That is where the optimization is part of the puzzle. You're trying to figure out, okay, if this thing takes me. 10 minutes by hand to do, how do I optimize it down to 3 minutes? 40 seconds. Right, that's literally the game. Yeah. A millisecond. But if we're talking about a reflex driven game or a game where there's a challenge, then it just feels like you're not really playing the game. And the worst thing, and this is something that again comes up with difficulty, is that if you don't learn why the game is being difficult or why the game is being challenging, you're not really going to grasp what the point of the core gameplay loop is. And this is one of the things I brought up in the uh, discussion. I think it's some, as you were just saying a few minutes ago, in terms of different choices. There's a difference between me saying, I refuse to use ice magic on every enemy. Even if this boss is literally, you know, takes three hits from an ice shot and he's dead. That's my choice and I refuse to, you know, change my way. Versus saying, well, if I want to use an ice magic or if I want to use it and the game just says, nope, you're not allowed to respect or you're not allowed to do that. And now it's harder because you don't have control. Those two things are not the same. And there are people who, and like to bring us back to Armor Core, there are people who argue, well, I don't want to change my build to fight a boss. So the game is bad. And then there's people who argue oh, I can just put on a double shotgun, full rockets, yeah, and yeah. I can, you know, two-second kill every boss, so the game is bad. And, again, it's that issue when we talk about challenge, and I want to get, like, this was something that I brought up in that piece I wrote, I want to get your thoughts on, and for anyone watching this live reported, 
the idea that the problem may be you in this respect when it comes to having trouble with a game. Because I feel like there's a lot of people, both like in the game journalism side, consumer side, and just people who study design, who tend to have that problem understanding maybe it's not the game's fault that I'm stuck at a level. Maybe it's because I'm not good enough. And again, like I've played games where I am terrible at them, as anyone who's watching me do driving or stealth or sports games. But there's a difference between me saying this game is bad because I suck at it versus I understand what this game wants me to do, but I just still suck at it. And of course, any rhythm driven game as well. Let me just throw that in there. <laughs> right. And I mean, like, like uh, part of that comes to like player preference. Right. And mm -hmm. I want to kind of like, uh, like how we talk about, you know, bring up cooking and like, I think difficulty is like the spice, right. That mm -hmm. you put over, you know, you have like juice, you have, um, and here's your spice, right? And and the spice is just put on. Some people really like it. You know, some people like it a lot. Some people are used to it burning hot. And like the the thing is, is like to being able to like objectively like look at it. I don't know, maybe a very hot Indian dish, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a curry dish, and 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 to understand, yes, this is a delicious dish. Right. But not being able to like enjoy the spice. I think that's what it's akin to. And so like going back to your point is that journalists do have like, I, I mean, I, as I was reviewing some of the game jam games, like maybe I wasn't good at the platformer, but I understood the mm -hmm. concept or I understood things about it or why it was difficult. Right. And like mm -hmm. what my deficiencies were. Right. So that's the things that you need to understand. Right. Like you could say, okay, is it the controller's fault? Like, is it the actual controller, the, the platform controller or is it myself or is it both? Right. And that's a really important like distinction that you need to make. If you mm -hmm. want to like study design, as you were saying, you really have to st take a step back as you do. As I've seen you do it like mm -hmm. it, literally with every game, you, you pull yourself back and and you're under you're looking at it as okay what does this game bring to the table what are they trying to teach me mm -hmm. and and then it, it's it's working with that bandwidth of you and the game together right mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean that definitely like if you want to study it like that's something that you have to do you have to take yourself out of the equation when mm -hmm. i am playing any game for research or anything and i'm trying to maybe figure out how they did us pull out mm -hmm. a, a certain technique how the ai is working etc i have to pull myself out of it right like mm -hmm. i can't be in a sense of suspended disbelief like fully and like with my uh you know inadequacies and and like my mm -hmm. personal biases on top of it because that's not truly like understanding and reviewing it right mm -hmm. um and then uh, uh, before i forget going back to uh the uh the min maxing po portion right it's like that also like if you were trying to like study a game right like okay if you're trying to have fun whatever it might be fun to just twink mm -hmm. out get min max and bull throws to a game but again at, you mentioned you're not going to understand the gameplay loop, right? Because you're mm -hmm. literally breaking it like 100%. And, mm -hmm. and so like, that's another aspect, right? Like if you're trying to study it, you have to take yourself out of the equation, your, your biases, mm -hmm. understand your ineffectiveness or what your strengths are, right? Like if you, for example, are just like killer at armored core six and you understand it, but I don't, but I have to understand you know, the, I, I, or I'm not good at it, and I have to understand, okay, the difficulties of it or why it's difficult, you know, so. Yeah. And uh, hello, uh, Rodolfo. Thanks for stopping by. Yep. Yeah. And Bro. like you just said, understanding why something is difficult, it is, no pun intended, very hard to do. Because like you said, there's your own internal bias. And as I said in the article, a lot of people don't like difficulty in their games. And again, as I made this point, it's very important to clarify here as well. There's a difference between challenge and difficulty. Like for someone like me, I've played a few platformers. So a hard platformer for everyone else may be child's play for me. But you put me in front of, let's say, a simple rhythm challenge game or a driving game, I'm going to have a lot of trouble in those games. 
And for a lot of people, when they're kind of, when, you know, the rubber meets the road in that respect, they're not going to try and push through it. And this is kind of what we saw with the armor core discussion, that a lot of the people who just, you know, fell hell, uh, head over heels in love with Dark Souls, Sekiro, Bloodborne, and so on, they hit that wall that, you know, they were making fun of everyone else for not getting good at. And a lot of them just like, no, you know, this boss fight is broken. And actually, that's a really good, I think that's a really good segue to this next question I want to ask you about. How, like, what do you think about, like, how do you figure out if something is not working? Because, as we said a few minutes ago, you need to get out of your own head when it comes to studying a game, studying its difficulty. But how do you start to put together if something just doesn't feel right? Well, I, I think, first of all, like, you're going to have an overwhelming feeling of like, unfairness, first of all, right? Like, mm -hmm. something is going to give it off, like, okay, am I, is it, you're going to start questioning yourself, like, things, like, is mm -hmm. it, what is it exactly that is, okay, we'll say, like, a boss fight, and this, this boss fight just seems extremely challenging in what it is, and, mm -hmm. and so then you'd have to break it down, like, is it that I got so soft locked, like, I didn't, upgrade enough points right is it that type of issue or is it like is it that maybe there's some issues with the bosses like attack like i think i would break it down on a like my, my mechanical level like is his hick box broken is he like mm -hmm. cheesing like repetitively the same thing or like does he have the ability to um like uh conquer my own weaknesses or understand my own weaknesses and mm -hmm. like you know, exploit them, right? And and I think that's when you can start to piece apart if it's like truly broken. But again, it's then like what aspect or or how is it broken? I think is is like the more important question. It's like okay, so it's broken, but what exactly is broken, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't know. For example, I could I could say fatal frame. For example, <laughs> is really difficult because I got to a boss and I was out of film. Right? Is it difficult? Why? Or why is it broken exactly? And I think that's that's when you have to start asking the questions. Yeah, and uh, to Adolfo's comment about fairness, I think that is another key point yeah. about this. And yeah. it's something that I brought up in the Souls-like design, that you need to give the player the tools that they need to succeed. Like going back to my earlier, earlier point, if you design a boss that, let's say, is immune to every damage but ice, but you don't give the player any means of doing ice damage, then that's kind of an artificial way of making that difficult. But if you give the player ice, or you, you know, give player multiple ways, you give them these different options, it has that level of fairness. It's kind of like that, another old saying, you know, everything you can do, I can do better. Like, if you're going to do this, I can match you with this. If I can match you with this, you can do that. And there is that kind of give and take that you need to have and it is part of what makes interesting enemy designs and bosses a lot of as anyone who's played any souls like or any action game some of the most memorable bosses in these games are when you're fighting an opponent of equal skill how many people you know enjoyed uh father cascone from bloodborne uh what was it um hmm I'm trying to remember some of the bosses. Uh, Champion Gundir was one of my favorites from Dark Souls 3. When it's a fight where you know the enemy's moveset because their moveset is well, very similar to yours. Right. Uh, Neo is another big example. How many of those humanoid fights, you know, made controllers snap in rage? Uh, what was it? Uh, the um, uh, Nobunaga and his wife battle in Neo 1. That was a fun one. And uh, fun hell, I should say. indeed yeah but uh like definitely when and that that helps avoid just real quick like it helps avoid that artificial uh difficulty is when the player understand like understands the rule set they feel like they're on equal footing and that you know when things feel unfair um then that's i guess that's like just artificial difficulty in a way right that's when it's broken and i guess we could lump that in that category right yeah and when we talk about kind of like the moves or the design clashing that is very hard 
to pinpoint if you don't understand or study design. Because it gets back to what we were saying earlier. Am I struggling because I'm not good at this game? Or am I struggling because the boss or the design is being right. tilted against me? And uh, Rodolfo brought up Lies of P. And yes, I got stuck at that first boss as well. Oh, is it out already? I think it's out literally next week. I think it's out on the 14th oh. or the 15th. And it's going to be on Actually, Games Pass. So I'll I be it. Okay. Yeah, and it like Lies of P was a really good example. We played the demo of that, and as I was trying to avoid and fight the enemies, I was getting like that little warning in the back of my head. Where, you know, if I try and dodge... But if the enemy can hit me while I'm dodging, or my dodge can't get away from the attacks, it feels like there is a clash in those mechanics. And some people argue, well, you just you know do frame perfect dodging, and that's fine. But again, that gets at one of these points. If you're trying to make a game that's approachable, asking everyone to do frame perfect dodging and frame perfect inputs is not how you're trying to build a market or build a wider audience. Now, right, you'd have to offer like another yeah. alternative, like yeah. a, that's a, like the the using the ice example. Your only example is frame perfect dodging. Not I can barely pull off a frame perfect dodge, right? Mm -hmm. So I would need another avenue uh, or a different way to attack it, right? Yep. And this is why when we look at like the Dark Souls and Elden Ring, if I want to build a character, I can go you know heavy block, heavy shield. Yeah. Dodging, summons, spells, range, you know, the whole can caboodle. If you're telling me that this boss can only be defeated by, you know, perfectly doing dodging. And I guess here's another interesting point about that. We've seen a lot of Dark Souls and Souls-like bosses that are completely and utterly shut down if you parry them. Blasphemous yeah. that we just finished the other... Yeah. Last week is a good example. I love of them though. I love parrying them though. Yeah. <laughs> it's so again, it's that kind of issue. Like if the parry is easy to pull off or it just requires a little bit more bite, I'm fine with that. But I can see how people can get very frustrated where you say, Oh, you can't block this attack, you can't dodge it. But again, it's it, it's that kind of difficulty in terms of how people approach these games. Because we've seen many games where Bosses and situations are designed around one or the best kind of way. How many action games have we played where they throw in like a sniper section? So if you weren't oh, yeah. good at, you know, kind of manipulate like the 3D analog or the analog like to hit that emu, your bow and arrow, you're going to get sniped by like 27 guys. <laughs> yeah. I love those parts, yeah. <laughs> and... Here's something that I was talking about, because we were playing Turbo Overkill this past weekend. Turbo Overkill is a very interesting game, because they keep adjusting the rules for the difficulty. It's already hit one point where they keep on doing these patch rebalances, and I'm not agreeing with these changes. So one of the things they did was they made on the highest difficulty, they not only increased the amount of damage enemies do by like 5 to 10 times... But they also make the projectiles, I think, 6.66 times faster. So it's even harder to process. But you see, the problem is in the last patch, they made environmental hazards now kind of proc the same amount of damage on what to believe you're on. So, like, in one situation, I went from 400 points of health and armor combined. I stepped in a pool of, like, toxic whatever for, like, two seconds. I was down to 15 points of health. Like, I yeah. melted. And so, like, what exactly, how does that, how is that fair, right? Mm -hmm. How does, how does that increase fun? And how is that in any way of, like, actually increasing difficulty, like, are respecting players, right? It's, yeah. it's like, it's like the simple way out is, of course, right, like, mm -hmm. giving them more health, giving them more damage, making everything faster. But... How is that truly, like, increasing difficulty in a satisfactory way? Yeah. And the fun thing, and this, again, gets at what we talk about when it, when it comes to difficulty design, is that the rest of the game is not meshing with this design right. decision. Because you can jump. You have a single jump and a double jump. If I jump over, so if, let's say my character's here, the toxic pool is here, even if I'm right here, it's still triggering the hitbox. 
So I'm still taking that damage, even if I'm doing a single jump. Right. So there, uh, I don't know, a viable option would be give the player ability to increase his jump, right? Um, you were talking about the speed of the projectiles. Give the player an ability to dodge faster or move mm -hmm. faster, right? Like, um, you have to give, if you change a metric, you have to give the player a way to counter it back effectively, mm -hmm. right? And navigate the new difficulty. Yeah. And this is where, like, again, when we talk about difficulty design games, there's two sides of the spectrum. One is figuring out how to make a game easier, or how to give the player the tools they need to succeed. And then the other way is how to build something that is challenging, but still, you know, engaging to the player. And when I was going through Turbo Overkill on the highest level, and I won't also stop this point because I know someone's going to argue this. There's a lot of people, when we talk about highest difficulty in games, they view it as kind of the unfair difficulty. That it's okay yeah. to break your game on super nightmare, ultra hardcore masochism difficulty. But yeah, we I, can get away with murder because we title it so. Yeah, <laughs> I do not agree with that. I think that good design should be balanced on every difficulty. And it's why I really like Doom Eternal. I felt they really nailed the balance of difficulty in Doom Eternal going from normal to nightmare. I don't count Ultra Nightmare because I consider that just to be hardcore difficulty, but it still felt good to play this game on nightmare. It felt like the, the challenge was right. But for a lot of these games, I know like uh, God of War 2018, like give me God oh, yeah. of War difficulty was a pain. That's yeah, terrible. The thing is, it wasn't, again, like, when we talk about this, like, someone will probably comment saying, you hated it because you sucked at the game, or, you know, you couldn't handle it. No, I hated it because it was boring to play on that table. It slowed the game down. It really showed the faults in that design when you play on the highest difficulty. And I beat the entire game. I did the Valkyrie Queen fight and give me God of War. So, I you know, got good, but I wasn't enjoying it as much. It's the same reason why I don't like to play a lot of, like, RPGs on high difficulty, because it's not testing the player, it's just pushing the uh, goalposts, you know, 10 to 20 right. more hours of grinding. Right, that's a real important uh, point you're making there, because, like, literally, it's just altering, like, you're altering the amount of time required, mm -hmm. right? Or, like, decreasing, or basically increasing it. It's like, okay, uh, a million hit points now and it's like nothing really changed they're just making all the numbers larger and instead mm -hmm. you're messing with the time right and so instead of like adjusting the player's enjoyment as you mentioned in doom mm -hmm. um and, and and allowing it to flow you're really putting roadblocks fit you know and and that's not the way to go about difficulty in design yep and i love the fact that in doom internal that I don't believe they actually change the stats of the enemies or, like, change, like, raw, like, damage or health going from each one of the difficulties. All they did was, I think, affected the aggressiveness of them. They made, awesome. as we, we talked about, like, how they have, like, that kind of, like, uh, behavior pattern. The, so, the know, pulling system, yeah. These three will attack, then this guy will attack, and then this one. And it still felt challenging, and it's why you always need to establish a really solid baseline of what yeah. you want your game to be, and then you can adjust things back and forth. If you're just kind of, as we've said, like if you're just taking a sledgehammer and saying, okay, now on hard mode, every enemy does 10,000 more points of damage, it just doesn't really end up being engaging. And with Turbo Overkill, it got to this point where it just was like, I could maybe do this, or I am, am I going to really enjoy this? Am I yeah, learning am I... anything more? Am I getting better at this game? Like, no, I just feel like I'm jumping through hoops. And right. it just, like, really sour me. Now, again, like, there's a good chance by next week there may be another bounce patch for Turbo Overkill that will change things. But that is not how you want to actually develop a game. You don't want to have to take these very wide swings in terms of, okay, Patch 1.1 made the game too easy. Patch 1.2 made it too hard. Now we're going to make it a little bit easier. Now we're going to make it harder. 
because it just ends up really frustrating a lot of people. And I've seen this in a, in a lot of indie games where they struggle with this idea of where is the challenge of this game? Is a challenge, you know, building a good character? Is it learning how to fight and dodge? Is it because every enemy, you know, has no, cannot be stun locked and can hit you through your own attacks? And if you can't figure that out before launch, it usually, unfortunately, spells doom and gloom for your game. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the point in Turbo Overkill where I just kind of like threw my hands up was like, what the hell game? Was they put you in this giant room with, there's three enemies that spawn complete opposite corners of the room, and they have infinite range tracking laser blasts wow. that they can hit you if you are within if you're in vision of them they can hit you from literally across the arena and remember on the simply i take 6.66 or whatever times more damage so it's kind of like hey i'm at full health hey i'm now at five points of health and again it was just like why like how am i yeah like it's not like really getting good it's just a case of well if three enemies can insta hit me with infinite range like it, there's nothing else for me to really get around that right and and then like you were like it and it basically becomes boring like you were stating uh like when you're talking about 2018 god of War, like it it just it was just un it was not fun to play like mm -hmm. if if there was like ebbs and flows and 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 like i was getting better like i already knew mm -hmm. good right but like there was no getting better again you're just trying to like slip through the hit the the, the hoops as you said and try and get by but you're not really like mastering anything you're not actually getting better and the enjoyment level just drops to zero and uh yeah it just doesn't yeah. work yeah and again it's the situation of trying to understand what is the game trying to teach you? And is there something that is teachable? Right. Because if it is just pain on top of pain on top of pain, that's not really teaching the player anything. It's just kind of creating this wall. And it was one of the things that I felt very frustrating about Doom Eternal's first DLC, The Ancient Gods, where the encounters just felt like they kept going on and on. It was kind of like, okay, I just survived this brutally difficult fight. Surely it's over. Nope, there's two more waves, and if you die, you have to repeat the whole thing over again. And it's hard to get that balance, because you can think that, okay, if everyone could beat the game at this difficulty, and now we're going to start the DLC here, surely they'll be able to get better, or surely there's more room to grow. But there's always that limitation of your mechanics. And this, again, goes back to a lot of Souls Lakes and Armor Core and so on, that if the solution is just above and beyond like if there is no solution other than just one way or the game just kind of ends here like let's say like this is the maximum skill level we're just going to keep raising the difficulty and you know good luck with it it's going to be very frustrating it gets back to that feeling of unfairness that i have all my weapons i'm fully leveled all my stuff but the end is just i go yeah, there's nothing more, there's no more depth to these mechanics. And that was kind of what I felt was happening with Turbo Overkill, that they raised the difficulty so high, but the mechanics and the tools Can't they were giving me were not, you know, growing in, con in concert with that. And right. So, so, like, I mean, basically the point is, like, raising, like, the only true way to raise difficulty is like also raising the player's capability in mm -hmm. some way or giving them some way to grow if they're like basically soft capped right they're like mm -hmm. their speed is capped everything's capped and you just you're like your lesson is now you learned that all the enemies have a thousand We're talking about, there's nothing learned there right there's no new concept understand or know nowhere to go and so you know that's just a fatal error and then you know it always it makes me go back to think that I, when we accept the, the fact, like, the harder difficulties being broken, and I, I think a lot of devs still are, are going with that. Like, they're like, okay, I can get away with it because it's hardcore. It can be completely broken. I think it would be better to literally leave it out and, like, 
I enjoy a game without difficulty, and so that that has like better prog- progressive difficulty all the way through, than like artificially inflating your difficulty in that respect. Yeah, and again, when you're trying to build the game, you have to understand what tools you're giving the player and how they can get around these challenges. Because as another point, something that we saw, and this was something that came up like during like the 2000s and 2010s, where developers boasting, oh, no one on the playtesting t- team could beat this boss or could beat this difficulty. Cool, cool. That's great, <laughs> as we saw with Diablo 3. Great when, job. <laughs> again, when we got that game for real and we started playing, we realized, oh, they couldn't beat it because the game is just being completely tweaked against the player and right. then they try to lie about oh you can t- you know we couldn't let you like run away from attacks because you know the servers wouldn't work that way right. and again like this is one of those major points for developers watching gamers are really good at sniffing out bs when it Gosh, comes to decisions. so fast so fast <laughs> if you do something or if you leave something that is broken or it doesn't work they will figure it out and they will deride you for it. They've been there before. It's like, it, it, the thing is, it's like, it's not the first, like it's not the first carding act, right? Mm-hmm. Like we gamers are super educated now and they understand these things. Like if you're on Diablo three, they played probably one and two. Right. And mm-hmm. so they're going to know why things are broken. And so gamers were, yeah, like you said, they're going to sniff it out super quick. And so just like taking the easy way out on difficulty and, Mm -hmm. you know, no one can beat this boss. That's like showing poor QA. And then if no one could beat it, why exactly couldn't Mm -hmm. you beat the boss? Right. Like that. Yeah. I I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a smart, just, I think maybe like they had high hopes that, okay, these, these 11 year olds will figure it out. Maybe I'm going to give them the benefit. Like an eight year old is going to beat it super quick. Josh is going to take mm-hmm. it down day one. Maybe mm-hmm. that's what they were thinking, but the reality is this is completely broken. And mm-hmm. as we were talking about earlier, you need to fix it. Yeah. And again, it's why that things are difficult that you have to understand. Because as we've said, like going back to the point about Armor Core, if the difficulty is because a player refuses to rebuild their AC, that's unfortunately something you can't you can't design a solution around that if you give yeah. the player the tools and the player just says you know what i refuse to use your tools and then they say well now i can't play your game it's broken you're again it's that kind of you know you're damned if you do damned if you don't kind of moment exactly but you have to give the player the tools and as i said earlier like we need to get away from this idea that there is the one true way of beating a game you want to have multiple ways especially if you have customization in your game if someone wants to play elden ring this only soul level one just wearing a loincloth for the entire game okay that's fine if someone wants to play this in you know uh mage warrior paladin that they just hold up their hand and they do like kamehameha moon blast and just like two shot every boss. Yeah. That's perfectly fair as well. But you have to give the player all those tools. And they have to understand what those tools are. Right. Yeah, I have to give the player the tools. And then you have to give them a reason, a way and a reason to learn the tools and an incentive, right? Like mm-hmm. um, it, it, when there's things that maybe a player may not want to do and you're like look there's a, a way there's different ways to attack this certain boss or this type of thing you need to give them maybe incentives in a certain way right uh to help them lead them that way but of course you can lead a horse to water and they won't drink so that is of course the difficulty and difficulty there mm-hmm. and the to all those common it's one of the things that we've seen in like really good games where you can do to like change the progression or change the uh, difficulty curve of a game, you can introduce new elements. You don't have to keep raising the difficulty up. Yep. There is a difference between an encounter that is, let's say, three swordsmen and two archers versus, let's say, four knights, an archer, and a wizard. And that can be different enough to challenge the player. Again, 
you don't want to just keep in your difficulty curve as just a linear growth. You know, right. level 10 is 10 out of 10 difficulty. Level 20 is 20 out of 10 in terms of difficulty because one, you are not going to balance that. And two, you're going to just keep losing players who don't want to just keep jumping through those hoops, uh, those flaming hoops, I should say. Yeah. Right. You know, giving the, the almost the, the some of the best ways is like giving the player the ability to uh, choose their difficulty in a way too. right. Mm -hmm. Like if a player decides to play it a certain way, they can. And that and that's just what we were talking about, like giving multiple avenues and multiple tools uh, to do that and not soft locking the player uh, or arbitrary, arbitrarily just like increasing uh, mm -hmm. stats without any way to combat it. So. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is very hard to do is get that kind of difficulty where the game actually feels easier as you play through it, even though right. the game is getting harder. And yeah, that's master class level. Yeah. <laughs> And that's something that a lot of from software games do really well. Like, there's people who complain, oh, the final boss is easy. Well, it's easy because you've been practicing and training for the yep. last 8 to 10 hours. Because you actually got good, as they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, it's why boss design is notoriously difficult to do right. Because yeah. you want the bosses to test the player. You don't want to introduce something that is just like its own unique difficulty spike. Where, you know, once you beat this guy, there's nothing else like it. Like, this was just a one-off kind of situation. Right. Like, you know, that's akin to, like, I don't know, your RPG one level. Like we were talking about it's an FPS corridor shooter, and then you go back to the RPG for the rest of the game. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, when you, when you throw a boss in that just totally breaks all the conventions, all the contracts, doesn't play by any of the rule sets, that is, in a way, like, artificial difficulty what actually are you testing in the player if you haven't given them the tool sets to deal with it or the understanding that even a boss of this nature or capability uh or something that follows these rules exist right so that's why that's really difficult you know without making all the bosses vanilla and mm -hmm. progressing at a rate that's total master class there yeah mm -hmm. so another big point when we talk about Divoli design is again like how far do you want to take it and yeah. what is kind of considered the final challenge of your game yeah this is one of the things i felt like doom eternal's base game didn't quite do well because i felt like the icon of sin and the boss fights didn't really test what the player was doing it just felt like here's a weird condition but you're still fighting all the other enemies around it and there are a lot of games that have that struggle in terms of how do you make a boss that feels legitimately different without just flat out breaking your own design? Yeah, and and I think I really struggle. Like last part. Oh, you're cutting out a little bit. And we were struggling to 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 think about what are the most memorable boss like last end boss that. Really master classes such as like the souls games and difficult progression like some of the like father gascon was like the most memorable to me like like mm -hmm. in bloodborne or like uh then the final boss and and so like that's a really difficult thing like how do you finally do like okay this is the this is the final chapter here's without it being a just a sledgehammer that breaks all conventions and also being new and refreshing. I think that's the really difficult part. And I, I honestly, I cannot think of like a boss uh, other than just like utter disappointments and bosses. I could name those and those could rattle them off, right? Like, I don't know, like the, was it the first Bioshock boss? Like, wow. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Like just so many like bosses that break all conventions. And so that's really difficult to do. I mean, off the top of your head, can you think of like really memorable end boss fights that like, weren't just like complete face melters and difficulty mm -hmm. or just complete pushovers like something that actually like this encapsulates everything the game mm -hmm. has taught me <laughs> here it is hey pony you miss everyone getting hey good pony at yeah difficulty. everyone got good already pony mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, i think the only two two balls that come to my mind would be a uh, sword saint ishan from sekiro 
and uh, the Virgil fight in Devil May Cry 3. I thought those two were really good cappers for what you had to learn in order to fight them. And yeah. coincidentally, they're both bosses that are like humanoid battles in those kinds of games. Yeah, Inshin, Inshin was definitely good. And humanoid, like we were talking about, and that's because like he he followed such a similar rule set to you, right? So mm -hmm. like you were you're on even playing fields, and like Inshin is testing everything that you've learned to that point. Um, and there's nothing really, there's nothing out of the ordinary or strange that you've never seen that's thrown mm -hmm. at you. So like again, the fairness is there, and it's literally just a test of every mechanic and every tool set that you've had up to that point. So yeah, um, okay. So there's one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, Virgil from uh, Double May Cry. And Virgil. Okay, so Virgil. Yeah. There we go, Virgil. Yeah, yeah that, one was, that was really good, yeah. yeah. And again, it's very hard to pull this off in a way that it feels right. Because there's a lot of people who probably complain that Ishin was, you know, it was an easy boss. You know, why was this the final boss? It just didn't really challenge me. And I don't think I actually... I think, like, once I got to him, I may have died, like, one time to that fight. And then I just uh, blew him and Genshiro out of the water. Like, it was just that easy. Right, almost these, like, throwaway fights. Like, they're just like, okay, get to the end now. Um, sometimes that, you know, I, I, I think mm -hmm. the, the hard, like, the hard, the difficult part, you said, like you said, is just coming up with something new and inventive that follows all the rule sets and, mm -hmm. and like, test the player in the correct way. And, uh, you know, maybe some devs are just trying to get it out of the way, make it memorable somehow, and, mm -hmm. and don't really like go back and understand, okay, everything that we have created and give the player uh, the ability to do, let's test that and let's uh, do that in a new and inventive way. So, mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, if you want to avoid like boss have like a very like annoying gimmick that just like, yeah. hey, the boss, you know, steps on the square three times, you automatically die. But yeah. the boss walks randomly, so there's no way to control yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, and you want to, again, like, avoid, like, to go back to the point of fairness, it's something I talk a lot about in the RPG book. One of the kind of big things that frustrated me about, like, early JRPG design was giving the boss complete immunities to certain tactics. Yeah. If, it, if yeah. you don't want the boss to succumb to a tactic, then don't have that tactic in the game to begin with. Because yeah. it just feels like, again, it's like a, like a gotcha to the player. Um, I remember, like, one of the things I love that they did with Etrian Odyssey was that they gave bosses and elites, like, resistances to ailments. But you could use a uh, one of, like, your ultimates could reset those uh, ailment weaknesses. So it got to the point where, like, I was just, like, chain-locking the final boss in one of the games with, like, all my stuns and all the... Uh, holes on their attacks like oh no they're resistant to it now okay let's wipe that clean right um persona uh, no not pers oh yeah yeah persona 4 the final boss in that one the whole key of that fight was i just spammed every debuff in that game i just spammed yeah, it on the that's boss what it was and right. it was like the boss couldn't do anything <laughs> and again like it, it in one way it's kind of like you cheating the game but in the other way, the game tells you, hey, this spell makes enemies miss more. Here's a boss that's very challenging. Let me debuff him so he misses yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then, you, right, and then it gave you the ability to check. You, you can check what their vulnerabilities are and everything. Yeah, same thing. Not yeah. gonna lie. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you, Pony, for bringing back that horrible fight from Darkest Dungeon 2. I don't think you played through it yet, right? No, I have not played through it, no. Yeah. But yes, that no. boss fight was a pain. And yeah, I've heard some pain. Again, the problem with kind of designing fights like this is that you always have to take into account what the player can and can't do. And it's very frustrating in games where the boss just says, well, I'm going to ignore three out of five of your entire list of abilities. I hope you brought those two abilities that I did, I'm not immune to, or you're dead. 
Yeah, and you also want to avoid like those clashes. Like the boss and darkest dungeon that we're talking about, it's a giant freaking eyeball that's immune to being blinded. I'm sorry, right. I can't throw sand in a giant eyeball's eye and not stop it from hitting me. <laughs> Let's see it. That yeah. would man, that would have really angered me not being like, giant. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. On the flip side, say when yeah, and that is another like very tough thing that ponies come and gets at the other side of difficulty is that if you give the player tools that are just completely unneeded, then it can feel like you're just bloating out the game just to say, yeah. oh, now I have eighty-seven different builds, but you're never going to need to use this, this, and this. And it's why a lot of Souls Lakes and why we talk about from software so much, they're very lean in terms of the different ways you can play it, but each way feels legitimate. Yeah. And it took them a while to get to that. For anyone who's played, you know, Dark Souls 1 through 3, they had a tough time of balancing how they wanted spells to work. In the yeah. first game, you know, it was just a limit. Spells and, and health and, uh, yeah, like the weight, the consumables mm -hmm. of health, right? And yep. spells. And, of course, you also want to make sure if something is consumable that it's easy to replenish. Because you don't want to just put into your game, okay, this item heals everything and kills a boss on one hit because the player's never going to use that. So you want to make your items bound so that people want to use them instead of hoarding them. Yes, right. I will die on that hill that those blood vials was a blood horrible blood vials. decision in that blood game. Vials. I, I don't know how much time I spent grinding for mm -hmm. blood vials to get my platinum. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. I, I probably more than actually playing the game. I was grinding for blood. That was yeah. terrible. And here's a bonus design tip for everyone watching. You don't want to put into your game punishment elements or difficulty elements that only affect people who aren't good at the game. This is what we talk about with like old arcade design, where hey, yeah. you took a hit, you lost all your powers and all your weapons. Because people will say, well, those games are easy as long as you never get hit. Then you're always going to be at full power. And if you're always at full power, then everything just dies in one hit. So why are you getting hit, a scrub? <laughs> yeah, it's like double pu double punish, double inverse punishment. Something mm -hmm. weirdly, really horrific, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's why I like really progressive difficulty settings. And again, players choosing the difficulty. It's why I love the pack of punishment from Hades. I'm trying to think, like, here's a question for you and for chat. Are there any recent examples of games that let you modify the difficulty to make it harder if you want? I'm trying to think, uh, my mind is drawing a blank. No, I'm drawing a blank. I'm going to have to call on chat here. I cannot mm -hmm. think of one. And you've played them all, Josh. Yeah. I mean, uh, Darkest Dungeon 2 had the kind of negative torches you could add to it if people want. So I guess that's kind of an example. Of a game that let the player make it harder in interesting ways, not counting Hades. Because I am definitely struggling to think of any other games that have done that in a way that felt interesting. And it wasn't just, okay, now you make every enemy take eight times more damage before they die. Yeah. And of course, yeah. stuff like Slay the Spire would be like older examples. I don't know. If, if this would be like a way of like actually tweaking the devil, make it harder in an interesting way. And uh, let me see, let me do a quick time check. We are about 53 minutes. We did start late tonight, so we'll probably wrap things up in maybe like the next 15, 20 minutes if that works for us. Yeah, yeah. So one thing that I want, well, actually, before I go, go to this next topic, anything else like on your notes that you want to discuss? Uh, no, I think that's it. I mean See you real quick. No, I'm good. Okay. So one thing that I want to bring up, because it's something that comes up with the Armored Core example, comes up with every example when we talk about challenging games, is why don't you just do difficulty sliders? And I am not a huge fan of difficulty settings in games. I feel like they oftentimes hurt the balance of the game. So yeah. I'm curious, like, what do you think about, like, having multiple difficulties? Like, what's a good example and what would be a bad example? Okay, well, uh, you were just talking about Doom, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be a good. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of against just like 
one difficulty. Like I'm all for like maybe two, like having like an, as an easy like story mode or something like that. But I think the difficulty should like be balanced in the game, right? Because like mm-hmm. you're kind of okay in a way you're like you're giving the player this option at the very beginning of the game. How difficult do you want to play the game? I've never played this mm-hmm. game before. I don't know what the optimal. So you're instantly giving me FOMO, right? Like if I did, I choose the wrong difficulty because I'm playing. Mm-hmm. Is it like now? I can't even like distinguishing like what are the issues, right? It'll be hard. Is it my deficiencies? Mm-hmm. Am I breaking down again? Yeah, you were breaking a little bit. Okay, but yeah, so it's just like instantly you're forcing the player to make a choice. No. And I think that is probably like one of the, um, you know, mm-hmm. difficulty settings in that respect. Would you, you agree? Like, yeah, like I'm not a fan when you have to make these choices before you even start playing the yeah. game. I huh. prefer, again, like let the player like start on normal, and then, you know, they can introduce, you know, a hard mode challenge or stuff like that. Yeah, like, like you're playing the game, and, and like, I, I can't. I've I am dropping out. I can't yeah. think of it, but there's many games where, like, uh, say you're dying. Would you like to go down? Oh, my, would you like to go down to a difficult? Your mic is uh, <laughs> your mic is on difficulty mode right now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah. and and like you're playing the game, and it's it's like okay, would you like to? You're dying too much. Would you like? Mm-hmm. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> okay, anything yeah. there? Yeah. Okay, I mean, and I don't know. We might have to cut it short. I'm not sure why my why I'm dying here. Okay. So, and then like, if you're doing uh, very well, then it's like, hey, here's the hardcore introduces to you, and that's a really nice way to do mm-hmm. Because again, like being forced to do that at the very beginning, how anything is balanced at all. Uh, it's just that's not really fair to the player or seeing them in a way kind of a cop out, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think to pony something about definitely being locked, I'm also not a fan of that because I feel like, again, yeah. like for it kind of gives it's like the developers under that impression that people are going to play through the entire game once, twice, right. three, four, five times. It again, we're not talking about like a roguelike. We're talking about a game that could be like an 8 to 10 hour long experience. A lot of people don't have an additional 8 to 10 hours to give to the same game. Yeah, exactly. And of like Diddly Sings in general, I would pr- I prefer, again, like making it more kind of like within the game. Again, like the customization aspect of the yeah. armored core or the different builds. But I feel like we need to maybe sp- Spell that out more to the player. You know how, like, when you're playing a game, like, and if you're playing, like, a management or economy game, like, it'll show you, you know, okay, this area has the most resources, or, like, this is the easier area to start, this is the harder area to start. I think we may need to start doing that for, like, action games, saying, hey, if you want to use, you know, shotgun, so on, you know, it's a 2 out of 10 in terms of difficulty. If you want right. to use the laser scalpel, uh, pillow cushion that's a eight out of ten in terms of difficulty. right right so like like you're starting the game and i like i don't know take bloodborne for example right you're starting and it has like those four weapons and it's like hey this weapon will probably make it if this this will probably make it in this way or this is Mm -hmm. and instead of having that choice at the beginning that you the player really doesn't have to the more descriptive you are about it, the better, right? So definitely. Yeah. And as a really good example, this Monster Hunter is a fantastic example of doing that with all the weapon classes. Hey, this is a giant sword. You use this to hit someone really hard with. You know, complexity 1 out of 5. This is the bow gun with all the different ammos. This is maybe yeah. a 4 out of 5. And 
to Pony's comment about, you know, a good dodge is still as efficient. That was one of the issues I ran into with Turbo Overkill. When, when they raised the projectile speed of the attacks, it got to the point where, you know, I'm getting hit by so before I can even process it. Like, here's an example of Brim when I do my review of it. During one of the sections, I am double jumping, dashing around using a grappling hook, you know, with those physics sending me all over the arena. And I'm doing that, and I watch an enemy just like, he's like facing this way, he immediately turns, angles a grenade lob that goes perfectly into me as I'm swinging. I don't even know where I'm ending up. It was able to calculate that and one shot at me. And I'm just sitting there going, how can I, like, if the enemy can track me that well before I can even see the shot coming, how can I improve? There, how can right. I do anything more there? Yeah, so like and like we were saying in that aspect, you have to utility. The projectile sped up. Like, do you have an ability to maybe dodge faster or slow down faster? Or like now, mm -hmm. other new of where the projectile is coming from. Um, of, of projectiles that you've never seen so a new type of indicator like just some new utility you introduce the because it's basically like a new mechanic right they're uh, an enemy that's just basically almost unbeatable because you can't see coming from mm -hmm. some way to counteract mm -hmm. so I don't even know what, what's coming through or not Josh <laughs> <laughs> Yep, and there has, like we said, there has to be give and take. If you're going to make something harder, the player needs to have those tools. If exactly. you take away the player's tools and you make something harder, then it just feels like you're just beating them and, you know, beating them yep. with a baseball bat. Yep, you learn the pain, yeah. Mm -hmm. Meaningless, meaningless pain, like meaningless, wasteful pain. Yep. Is there, like, a way, is the player learning something through the yeah. game? And like exactly. to Pony's comment about, you know, you t the enemy attacks and they recover before you can even get an attack off. What oftentimes, like, people seem to, I've heard people who like that kind of typically like in beat em ups or in action games, but it often reduces them down to, well, if they just automatically attack, then I just need to do, you know, one hit that's the safest way, and then I just repeat that for five to ten minutes because anything else leads to death. And it's right. why, again, you want to balance things so that they feel good. I forget what I was reading. I was looking up something about a game. I remember them saying, like, in order to balance it, they slowed the enemy's attacks down just by a little bit. Because if they kept the enemy at, like, full speed, it would be impossible to dodge. Like, the player literally can't react at that level. Yeah, well, okay. Or the jump kick. That was in a lot of BMO. Just keep jump kicking them over and over again. Right. Yeah, the jump kick. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with punishing. Um, and annoying difficulty, yeah. like when like those Mega Man enemies, that's just like poor design, right? Like something as we were talking about earlier, uh, like uh, the design is broken, right? And that's like a design with like the size and the hitbox and like where, what yeah, and like as a good example that when you have flying base enemies in an action game and your controls just don't let you jump yeah. up and hit them. Yeah, it is the best. That is feels so I, I good. I said the same time <laughs> Pony did. Oh yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. The rats. So it's basically rats, flying things, dogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> flying rats will be the ultimate flying enemy. Rats. That needs to be in Samurai Pig. Like adding the them ultimate. right now. Adding them right now. <laughs> For extra horror difficulty. All enemies are just flying rats. Right. That's pro that's a progressive one, but you will have an ability to deal with it. Trust mm -hmm. me. <laughs> yeah. Yep, and Pony is right about Blasphemous too. There, like every weapon has a way of dealing with air enemies. And it felt good to hit them. And Again, like, we're not getting on the subject of fuel tonight, because, you know, we started no. late, we'll be here till like, 2 o'clock in the morning, yeah. for that rate. But it's why you want the player to have all the tools they need to succeed. And, again, like, to bring this back to the point about Dibbly settings, if the player can just lower the Dibbly down to, you know, I instantly kill every enemy, 
if they don't learn why they're struggling or how to beat these enemies, they're not going to stay with that game. And I, I mentioned this the other night with Eichenfeld, that I loved Eichenfeld from a story perspective, but the gameplay just really wore itself thin for me in terms of the uh, action command interface and just like how annoying it got to fight some of those enemies. So I turned on auto win in that game and I, sure. I think I turned it all like about like 40 to 50% done that game. And as I said this before, some people will argue, well, that's proof that that system works. But I would argue if I needed that in order to finish your game, something is not right with those mechanics. I I think I equated this in another piece. Of like It's kind of like airbags. You don't want someone to have to use airbags in order to drive your car, but they need to be there as the last, you know, as your contingency plan. Yeah. So if they have to rely on that, then something else is not working right. Yeah, if they have to grab the get-out bag, right, the evacuation bag to get through your game, it, it's, it's like you were saying, it's like, you know, it's a Diablo boss, Diablo 3 boss there issue. Yeah, there's no place. Oh, yes, and that can be very annoying as well when you're just eating up t the player's time. To do right, something. respecting the time, respecting the time, right? Mm-hmm. And not respecting the player's time, uh, yeah. it, it is not. And I... mm -mm. <laughs> the microphone <laughs> is giving you a difficulty, a it's, challenge. It is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was progressive difficulty, though, like, because it's at, at the beginning, it was, it was good. <laughs> the next step is just going to start, like, sparking as you try right. to lean in. <laughs> and after the sparking, then comes fire. Fires next, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then the uh, flying rat will come in. And start. Uh... That's a flying rat, yeah. Mm -hmm. gonna, and then the dog at the same time. Mm -hmm. Be a dog and a flying rat next yeah. podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, to ponies come about cookie cutter tools and stuff like that. Again, it's why difficulty and progression is an essential part of designing a game, especially a reflex driven game. You want the player to feel like. Again, as they're improving, the game is either, you know, keeping pace or maybe it's just, like, slightly above. You don't want to feel like, okay, it's an 80-hour game and I've mastered it at hour two. So now it's just 78 more hours of doing the same thing over and over again. And again, we have seen plenty of lesser action games, Metroidvania games, Souls Lakes, where, okay, if... I can just dodge roll through every enemy, then, you know, every boss or every encounter just dodge roll behind them, backstab, rinse and repeat for the next 15 hours. And, <laughs> and that is not how you want to pitch your game. You want there to be this sense of growth. And growth, again, can come from unique enemies or making things more challenging. But there has to be, again, a breadcrumb for the player to follow. Definitely, yeah. There has to be a reason, there has to be an incentive uh, for them to want to grow. And, and like, mm -hmm. just squashing them with, like, just ridiculous challenges that are not fun, exciting, are actually quite boring, and mm -hmm. are very wasteful of the time is just it's not respectful mm -hmm. of the player at all, right? And it's like, you want the player to enjoy your game and have fun. And, like, uh, overcoming a challenge in the correct way with the right tool sets is very fulfilling, very will keep your player mm -hmm. I don't know what went through on that one. <laughs> Mosa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and since we're talking about like difficulty that just felt too much, and Pony's on chat, you can talk about how great it was to play Crash Bandicoot 4. And oh, just yeah, that's right, the Pony. horribleness <laughs> and how it broke me. He and followed it up with that with Rayman after that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Raymond was easy. Like Raymond felt like a nice little uh, Sunday <laughs> stroll compared to, uh, to Crash Bandicoot Four, <laughs> and it wasn't just the fact that it was hard. It was because they punished you because of that in order to get perfect, you had to get through some of these levels deathless, and that just felt so frustrating again if you want someone to do something challenging make it as easy as possible to get back to that point yeah. you don't want to spend you know 40 minutes to get back to the five minutes that you failed 
to then die, to then go back to the previous 40 minutes, to then get back, to then die, and yeah, then someone's throwing so a computer out minutes. the window. Yes. Yeah, there's only so many 40 minutes you got. <laughs> like <laughs> That sounds like a good like daily affirmation. <laughs> there's only so many 40 minutes. <laughs> That's right. The mm -hmm. level is 15 to 20 minutes just to play the... Wow! Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And then, uh... Oh, I don't remember the names, but I'm pretty sure it, it's still Crash broken. landed. Crash oh, landed. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> and then, oh, no, you miss one crate, and then you die, but then because you died, you then lost the perfect, so then you have to go all the way back, and then... You have to repeat it, and then oh, you miss the box again. Go back to start. That's that's just sadistic and like Thank poor you. planning, right? And and then again, not respecting the player's time. Like like okay, just because you want to play a hardcore, not me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the <laughs> oh yes, and thank you, Pony. And then they had the secret gems, and you had to go back to them, and then find them. And then you gotta do their sections, and then oh, uh, you died. No. Now you gotta repeat the gem section, and then get back to the level. Yeah. And again, like I think I said this, like you could use like the Mister Incredible going uncanny uh, meme from how I played through Crash Bandicoot Four. It's like, oh, I'm so happy, it's easy. And then you start doing the challenges, and then the pain begins. <laughs> and then you really hate your life and your decisions yep. you made to get to that point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's why I really enjoyed uh, Pizza Tower. I felt Pizza Tower handled its highest like form of challenge, P ranking, very well. The fact that you didn't need to play through the levels like one hundred percent optimally. You had ways to get around challenges. You had like kind of your super move you're about to get hit. Or your combo's about to run out. Like, perfection in Pizza Tower wasn't playing through the levels 100% perfectly. It was just, again, the best way or, you know, proving you've mastered these levels. Right, right, right. Yeah. I know, I think you tried and it didn't work for you. But it was still, I think, a, it, it was, again, one of those games that I think a lot of people did bounce off of Pizza Tower just because it handled very differently than anything else that you yes. played. Yeah, it was, I think the handling kind of threw me off at first. Yeah, I'm curious, really fast, what is the churn rate of Pizza Tower now? Pizza Tower. I gotta give it another try. I saw and uh, I was staring at me at the desktop and I, and I read your uh, difficulty article, so I almost fired it up again. I have to <laughs> And uh, oh, let's see. Level 1. Looking at this, they did lose about like seventy, looks like sixty percent of the player base very quickly. Yeah, sounds and, about right. <laughs> yeah, and again, like you're always going to have people who will bounce off of games. What you don't want is eighty percent of your player base to quit before twenty minutes is up. Yeah, yeah, and the Millennia fight in Ellering that I hated that fight. I did not finish it with my build because I did not build the right character for the that. The right build, yeah. Yeah, I think that was like a really one of those walls, right? It's like you kind of needed a, a, a good build for that. Yeah. And ultimately, if you're going to do like different difficulties and make it work really well, I also think having each difficulty act as the precursor of the challenge or the next one can work. There was something yes. that Ninja Guy in Black did well that each difficulty mixed the game up. It became harder, and there was a legitimately different way of playing the game on normal, hard, very hard, Master Ninja. There may have been one more on top of that. But it felt like it was training you to get better. I think that's the only time where I would be fine if difficulties were locked. If there is a legitimately different way of, you know, hard mode is different than playing on very hard mode, which is different than playing on normal. Let's see the other challenge. All right, I think with that, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, anything that comes to your mind. I think that's it. I might have had more, but I don't know I could <laughs> how my mic is going to do. But yeah, I, that's basically it, yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk about the last Soulmate Cry. No. 
But well, that's interesting. Those kinds of modes are very fascinating to me, where everything dies in one hit. Like, that I'm fine with. I'm not fine with, like, if I die in one hit, but everything else still takes 20, 30, 50 hits. Like, that was what the, drove that's me... That's fairness. Yeah, that's what drove me crazy trying to play, like, Nier Automata and the original Nier on, like, the highest civilly. Where it's like, yeah. oh, they'll kill you in two hits, you guys still hit them in, like, 15 yeah. to 20 hits to kill one enemy. And again, that's you are not on a level playing field. <laughs> yeah. Thundered. Which one is Thundered? Sounds familiar. Oh, there it is. Oh, is this what the one that I think it is? Yep. The one from Thunder Lotus. Yeah, that one was a pain higher difficulties. I'm going to be very interested to see where Ultra Kill is going to settle in terms of specifically when it hits 1.0, because it has a lot of challenge to it, and there are so many secrets and alternate bosses and stuff like that. And I know people who have played through and they've S-ranked every level in that game, and I haven't even begun to even think about processing how to do that. And yet, yeah, to a pony's comment, yeah, that's another good way of designing difficulty, is to have it as kind of an optional challenge or a reward for players. And then, you know, if the player wants to do it, they can do it. If they want to ignore the super hard, fiery pit section, okay, that's fine. But again, like, that is very hard to design when you're essentially building levels around like two to three different difficulty settings without, you know, all internally sure. within that level. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, good. Back up, back up, Mike. Yeah. You're a little bit quiet, though, on that one. Okay. <laughs> Mike's sort of possessed here. It's a tag team uh, boss fight. The smog and Ornstein of microphone issues. <laughs> All right. And you can have different ways of making things harder, but they have to be interesting ways of making things harder. If they're not, then it's just masochism. And most people don't like masochism in their games. <laughs> no, no. I mean, like, like we were talking about Spice being, um, like, the difficulty, right, in a game. Some people don't like it at all, right, in their games. Some people like it a little bit. And in, when you're introducing it and you want to make it spicier in your game, you have to, you know, maybe the, the, the player a little bit, something to drink with it, and, you know, to combat the spice is all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as, as a really good point to that, one thing you also want to avoid is taking away tools when you're trying yeah. to make the game harder. Because yeah. that was one of the things that killed me about Dead Cells, when they reduced the number of ways you can heal in that yeah. game. Like, that to me is the wrong... That to me is, again, taking away the player's ability. And yes, nice. again, it's technically making the game harder, but is it making it interestingly harder? And... I just didn't see it that way. Yeah, it's making it, removing the player's utility, something they can do, something they can use, making it uninterestingly harder, and like, kind of, again, just a cop-out, and not really increase the penalty. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mike's working when I don't want it to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... I think here's my final point, and then we'll wrap things up, because once again, I have dinner waiting, so I need to get to that, and yeah, then we cool. got to do some other stuff. But my final point is that when you're thinking about difficulty, you want to balance your game. You want to, again, think about interesting and fair ways of challenging them. But you also need to present this in a way that the player understands that this is meant to be something that's explored. It's why, again, I was not a fan of just saying that every game should be beatable by everyone. Like, you, there has to be some spikiness. And to Josh's analogy about spice, again, some people like lots of spice, some people like very little or no spice. But you need to establish at the start what that spiciness is. You know, yeah. if you go to a restaurant and they hide the fact that they use a ghost chili, 
There is a fun thing. Just the rest are just it. like brand <laughs> RNG spice. You know, you get yeah. a burger that has ghost chili on it, and then another soup that has like nothing on. You'll never know which one it is. Just a hidden one chip challenge for you, like. Yeah. <laughs> And yes, and difficulty and progression should make the player engage with the game more. It shouldn't right. be difficulty that just says, hey, you like using swords? Well, every enemy now is sword immune. You want it to feel like there's more to it. Literally an incentive, right? Difficulty should be an incentive to want to play more. There's a reason to want to play more. And um, that's like the one of the main points, right? It's like, I'm going to test myself because I like this game a lot. So I'm going to get better at it, right? But you're not getting better at it by artificially inflating things or removing things or uh, mm -hmm. not giving the player you yeah. stuff. So, And here's one of my biggest pet peeves in action games, where the higher difficulty just basically means you can't do like crazy combos or use additional abilities because, hey, if I stand still for more than half a second, this guy just goes like that yeah. and I lose 75% yeah. of my health. Yeah. Again, you don't want things to be turned off that the player can do to make things harder. Again, like this is one of the things that annoy me about with uh, Turbo Overkill, where I have the ability to grapple to enemies, but while I'm grappling towards an enemy, he just turns around and goes, boop, and I'm dead before I even get within range of hitting them. Yeah, you want to engage with the mechanics. Let's see. Enemies out. And <sighs> Grim Dawn did something interesting with the difficulty that when you play on the higher settings, they increase the uh, drop chance of better magical items in an ARPG. I think that's an okay way of doing it as well. Uh, some of my friends were talking about Payday. Payday makes things they have the different achievements. They actually change from the maps up on the higher difficulties. But again, there's always that limit. I guess to my final, final, final point. You don't want to segment the player base in terms of what works and what doesn't as you go up in higher difficulty. Because if, let's say, again... If you have 15 different builds, but only two of them are viable on the highest difficulty, then guess what? Your game only has two builds. Because why would someone want to learn and master a build that gets shut down? That was one of the things that just frustrated me, frustrated me about a Payday 2 with like one down mayhem difficulty. Where if you don't build the exact character, the exact builds, there's nothing more you can do. Yeah, what's the point? Yep. yep. Give the player incentives, make them engage with the challenges more. And when you do that and it becomes interesting, then the player can feel like they can tweak the difficulty and make things harder. And that is ultimately, I guess, one ultimate final point. If you as a designer can make the player want to make the game harder, yep. then you yep. have done a fantastic job. Yep. And I'm going to stop talking before I have 10 more final points. So anything no, is... I'm not going to add. I think you, you, you summed it up perfectly there. I'm not going to test my mic. It's in on senior mode right now. So I'm, I'm all right. So, but yeah, that, that's perfect. Perfect anyway. All right. So with that, we will say goodnight. It is time for uh, the uh, difficulty of having dinner late. Yes. And um, we'll be back next Saturday around a regular time, hopefully weather and so on permitting, around 5 p.m. ET. Even a suggestion for a top for us to cover or anything like that, let us know in the comments. As for me, you know, do the YouTubing stuff, check out my Discord, my Patreon for the game recommendation newsletter, buy all the books. The more books you buy, the easier your life will be. So make sure to buy at least 100 copies of each book. Reduce that difficulty level mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and for me, uh, same old, uh, my links are down below, wishlist, wish to rampage, samurai. That'll make my difficulty uh, easier. Um, and uh, join Josh Discord, buy the books, and we'll see you next time, yep. Josh. Yep, and uh, maybe for next week we can talk a bit more about the game jam as we'll be wrapping up the judging for it. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah, I know that was that was really good. I really enjoyed it. Amazed by it. good job. Mm -hmm. So everyone, with that said, have a great rest of your night. Stay cool or stay warm depending on how the weather changes. And come back for the discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we some of the art and science of games.